Radio Cardiff. 98.7 FM. Good afternoon. You're listening to news, views, and interviews on Radio Cardiff. 98.7 FM. I'm Jane Morris. And, well, I'm joined on the line now by a guy who needs no introduction from me, really. Aid Edmondson. Hi, Aid. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing today? I'm pretty well. I'm pretty bright, yeah. I'm in Glasgow today. Oh, are you? Yeah. Well, you've just started your tour, haven't you, with the Bad yeah, Shepherds? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you'd yeah. be coming down to Cardiff... 27th of November, I think. Tell us a little bit about the tour, please. Uh, well, you know, the Bad Shepherds have been going for five years now. It's a kind of accidental band. It's mm-hmm. a band that sort of happened by accident. I acquired a mandolin. I've got a lot of stringed instruments, but I acquired a mandolin. And... Um, was, you know, I don't know, do you play an instrument at all? I did at school. You know when you pick one up, you know, like you pick up a guitar, you immediately play your favourite songs, don't you? So I, I acquired this mandolin and immediately started playing London's Chorus by The Clash. And uh, as I was playing it and sort of working out these chords for it, I thought, oh, that's, that sounds different. And, uh, and so I sort of formed this band, The Bad Shepherds, with some uh, proper folk musicians on the pipes and fiddle and stuff. And we, um, we make a glorious racket. That's what we like to think. Well, you have bought a uh, new album out in August, wasn't it? Mud, Blood yeah, and yeah. Beer. I was listening to it yesterday. And I have yeah. to say, like, I'm, I'm not sort of into my folk music very much, but I really loved it. Well, that's what we do to most people that come along. Most people come along thinking, uh, I sort of get it. It's, you know, punk songs, folk instruments. Not sure I like folk music, but I'll go along because Aid's doing it, so it'll be worth a punt. And by the end, we've usually converted them. I mean, because we don't really play folk music in the twiddly D style that a lot of people play. We play it with guts. We give it some welly. Thrash mandolin. <laughs> I don't play ordinary mandolin. <laughs> it's not something that you'd immediately think of, is it? Punk folk. Well, do you know, it's not something you'd immediately think of, but I remember when I was a student in Manchester in the 70s, I was in the drama department, and there were two venues near, near me. 100 Yards Away was a place called The Squat, which was full of kind of punk bands. And 100 Yards the other way was uh, an Irish pub, Juicy, that was full of session, you know, Irish session musicians. And it struck me at the time that they were both very similar. They both have that kind of wild abandon when they kick off. You know, if you listen to proper tune playing, I don't mean, oh, my lover's left me on the beach, <laughs> things like that. I mean, I mean those proper kind of Cayley type um, musicians. It's as exciting as punk. You know, it's all about speed. Yeah. And kind of excitement and, and this kind of change you get from a, I'm going to sound technical now when you when you change from from a, a jig to a reel you change time signature and it kind of kicks off it's like suddenly you, you, from doing drunk dancing suddenly you're doing full on metal dancing it, it's great fun I love it well I was sat in the office with my headphones on and I, well I couldn't keep still listening well, you're to you thrashing your hair about <laughs> as if you were a Timothy advert <laughs> <laughs> not quite <laughs> Oh, gosh, I'd forgotten about those adverts. Yeah. <laughs> you've got a couple of tracks that you've written yourself on this album, there. Well, you have, yes. Mm. It's a departure for us. Third album, we thought we'd... Um, well, they just sort of came out. They just... Um, sometimes things happen and you just can't stop them coming out. So they... Uh, I mean, Mud, Blood and Beer is, is a song we've written. That's the title of the album. And it's, it's just a kind of anthem to all the festivals we've played. We've played a shed load of festivals. And uh, we love doing that. And there's a kind of special community of festivals, which is what we adore. And it's, it's a song about that, really. No, I do like that. Well, I really like off, off to the Beer Tent as well. Off to the Beer Tent, yeah. yeah. yeah that's... Well, that's just a load of jigs and reels, really. But it, it goes into a bit of prog at the end, doesn't it? I quite like that. <laughs> it yeah. disappears into the fun fair. I think probably the favourite cover for me, certainly on the first listen to it, is The, the Lunatics Have Taken Over the Asylum, though. I yeah. really like that one. Cracking song, isn't it? It is a cracking It's amazing song. all those songs, you know. I mean, it's not true of all punk songs, but a lot of punk songs are quite adult. You know, you, you think it was all about disaffected youth, but all those songs are still very true. I, you know, we do um, Going Underground by Paul Weller, and um, I was singing it last night, and as I was singing, I was singing, this is just so current. It's just on the button still, you know, after yeah. all this time, but written by an 18-year-old in the, in the early 70s. And you think, that's madness. Well, it is a bit, but I suppose in some ways the 
political situations almost come full circle. Yeah, it's it? come full circle, isn't it, really? Yeah, because yeah, a lot of those songs are written at a time. Well, obviously we had Thatcher and that, didn't we? So yeah. uh, a lot of people were under the cosh then, and they are again now, aren't they? Oh, it's funny, you know. We do a version of "God Save the Queen" by you know, the Sex Pistols, and uh, we were doing it in Glasgow last night, and um, and it's got it's got. I never can, never kind of occurred to me before. Uh, but it's all the all the all the references are to England. It's England's dreaming, not Britain. And of course, here I am in Scotland. They're about to vote on independence. And uh, I got to the end of the song, and of course, I said, "Of course, she won't be your queen much longer, will she?" <laughs> and uh, I didn't get the response I expected. I expected them all to cheer. Yeah. But they were all very miffed. <laughs> oh right. Oh okay. <laughs> That's very funny. Uh, so may- maybe you're getting a better feel of uh, what the vote will be like than all yeah. these uh, political pundits out there. Yeah. Most people, when they, when they think about you, they just think about you doing the comedy. It's fair, it's fair enough, isn't it? Well, <laughs> yeah. It. Well, let's face it, you know, that's, that's how people got to know you. You are very yeah. good at it. But uh, music seems to have taken over a little bit. Um, I kind of stopped doing uh, the full-on comedy thing. It's something I don't want to do. I just, I, I wanted to stop it being my main job mm-hmm. about 10 years ago. And... Um, I've done quite a lot of stuff since then. Played a lot of these kind of um, uh, documentary type programs, you know, going around Britain looking at stuff. Spent three years in Holby, you know. Uh, it's, uh, it's. I just think there's more to life than than you know. Having one string to your bow is very boring. I think I was just bored. Yeah. So what inspires you now, though? Um, this band is is my is my love. Mm. Um. We, we did Australia last year, and we're doing it again, and we're doing bits of Belgium and Germany. And it's just an adventure. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's like a, I feel like a kid. There's times when me and Troy, is a band member, just look at each other, and, and we say, as if we're teenagers, we're in a band! <laughs> 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 and it's just, it's just so exciting. Yeah. You know, I love everything about it. It's all I ever wanted to do. When I was a kid, and... The option, you know, you were kind of pushed off to uni um, when it was free. I didn't really want to go because I'm lazy. Uh, so I chose the, the, the course of least resistance, which was drama. But if there'd been a DOS's course in music, that, that's where I would have been. My heart's always sort of been there. Yeah. I mean, the early stuff Rick and I used to do was all me on the guitar. Oh. And sort of weird songs that we used to write about tube trains. <laughs> you guys pretty much met on day one at uni, didn't you? We did, yeah. Yeah, as we got off the bus, he was uh, in front of me, flicking his hair about as if he was in a Timothy outfit. <laughs> Does he still and I do thought that? then, oh, what an idiot. <laughs> so it's always the way, though, isn't it? The person you think yeah. like that, you end up being good mates with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. Then we became very thick. <laughs> Who were your influences, then? Should we go musically first? Musically, my influences. Mm. My favourite is, is, is either David Bowie or Nick Cave. I mm. mean, those are the things I still listen to endlessly. Yeah. I mean, the whole punk catalogue was very kind of important because we kind of grew up at the same time. We I went to uni in '75, and it 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 kind of although it took us a lot a while to get our stuff out there, the comedy we were doing then was inspired by the movement, as it were, mm-hmm. and the fact that it was kind of do it yourself. The ethos of punk was you don't need a record company, you don't need a, an established venue, you don't need you know you don't need to use any of the kind of tools that the sort of people before you have used. You can just do it yourself. So that's what Rick and I did. We just did it ourselves in the corner of a pub and kind of started that. what well, it was called alternative cabaret. It was this, you know it was, it was a kind of kind of movement, much like the punk movement, but for comedy, inspired by the same kind of principle. Because you know comedy before then was. Oh, yeah. Well, it's untrue to say that it was bad. Yeah. There were stars like Tommy Cooper and oh, yeah. Morecambe and Wise. But the, the general kind of comedians, you know, those people in dicky bows and fruit mm. shirts and bow ties, it was all very tedious. There was a show you know, called... I sound old enough, but I tell you, it was really boring. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite as old as you, but there was like a show a show called The Comedians or something, wasn't oh, there? Oh, God, it was appalling. <laughs> yeah. It was toe curling. <laughs> so embarrassing. It's a load of sort of racist gags. It was just, um, it's unbelievable to think it was on telly. 
You know, you can't even show clips of it now. No. Because it's just so so offensive. It's extraordinary what we allowed. Times have changed, I guess, yeah. in some but ways. See, Malcolm and Wise didn't have to do that. No. Tommy Cooper didn't have to do that. So it wasn't a necessary thing. It was just those particular people. They were evil. Mm. Well, you have had a bit of a recent spat with, um, what's his name, Jim Davidson. Well, I'd hardly say spat. To well. be honest, I didn't know he was still alive. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the best way, really. If I'd known he was alive, I probably wouldn't have been as horrible about him. But I don't, I don't really go into personality battles, but yeah. I'm just saying thematically those comedians mm. are really boring. Well, it was all about the lowest common denominator, wasn't it? Yeah. See, some of them are technically brilliant. When Rick and I used to tour, we were often on the same circuit as um, people like Roy Chubby Brown. Mm. And I remember having my tea with Roy once um, in a Liverpool hotel. And he's, he's an incredibly funny man, technically brilliantly gifted. It's just a third of his material is about race. And you can't, make, you can't open his eyes, you can't, you can't make him aware that if he dropped that, he'd have been huge. Yeah. He'd have been an enormous star. Yeah. I mean, he's still been pretty busy. He's done very well life, but well, he is. It well, he's still going around, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. Well, he's, he had a bit of trouble with his throat, didn't he? he had throat cancer, I think. Oh, so right. Doesn't do as much as he used to because he can't talk for as long. It's all about the music for you at the moment. But are you going to be going back to a comedy at any point? Um, I've got no. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I've got a little pilot in at the BBC. Actually, we oh. made a pilot last week. Uh, me, Phil Jupiter's. Neil Innes and Roland Rivron, a thing called the Idiot Bastard Band, which is another little hobby of mine. Music-related comedy. We did a tour last year. It all just started off doing Monday nights in a pub, that band, just for the fun of it, because there's a kind of wealth of um, comedy songs that seem to get, you know, not played enough, so we started playing them and then started writing some of our own. And it's kind of evolved into a Radio 4 pilot idea. Play it's a bit like the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band, basically. Right. Bonzo's big hit was um, uh, one of their big hit. Uh, they only had one hit. They, <laughs> <laughs> I was in the band for a while, a few years ago, and they used to call it "Now Our Medley of Hit." <laughs> um, their, me- their medley of hit was "The Urban Spaceman." That's the one, yes. But that was untypical, really. The the, the stuff on the records is just genius. I found that when I was a schoolboy. It, it was fantastic stuff. It was so uh, seditious. And John Peel used to have Vivian Stanchel on his late night show. And he'd do this kind of running um, kind of soap opera about Rawlinson's end, sort of impoverished old stately home. Oh, it's very funny. He yeah. made a film about it. Did you ever see that? Sir Henry at Rawlinson's end. I do remember something vaguely from a very long time ago where someone played everything in a stately home. I'm not sure if that's the yeah. same one. Obviously, I remember you in The Young Ones and Bottom, but, you know, it, back in those days, you only had one TV in the house and, like, the parents controlled it. So yeah. to be able to watch your shows, I had to kind of sneak it in when they were out of the room or something or go to my friend's yeah. house and watch it. I had the same when I was a kid. My dad wouldn't let me watch Python because he, he said it was too silly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like one of the characters in Python. <laughs> I think I had probably the same comment about your shows, actually. They're too silly to watch. Yeah. (laughs) But it's almost like, I don't know, is there anything sort of naughty like that anymore for young people to get around their parents? Well, it seems that that comedy now isn't naughty anymore. It's just plain rude, isn't it? Yeah. It's very kind of un... Sophisticated. Not yeah. saying that ours is particularly sophisticated, <laughs> but it, I don't know. There seem to be more to laugh at. I mean, comedy in depressions usually takes off. You usually get the best comedy mm. in, in, in the middle of economic downturns, and it hasn't happened in this one, to, to my mind. Go That's on. kind of symptomatic of the fact that there's a kind of... There's a split between uh, the haves and the have-nots, and while there's been a depression, I think only half the country's been suffering it. Mm. You know, half of half the country hasn't quite been nailed down as much, you know, and uh, yeah. hasn't kind of engendered this surge of acerbic comedy. Yeah, I mean, you had not the nine o'clock news and then spitting image and all of those kinds yeah, of spitting lumping. image was amazing, wasn't it? Oh, Why yeah. isn't there a spitting image? I, I mean, I suppose know. the only equivalent is Have I Got News For You is the only kind of satire mm. on telly. But it's, it's not as vicious, is it? I mean, it's no. very good. I love Have I Got News For You, but there's no, there's no one doing that 
really biting stuff. Just thinking back to it now and spitting image, I mean, the way that even you just took Thatcher, the way her puppet changed over the years, you know. Yeah. Now, the world's getting paler, isn't it? Yeah. Everyone's on their phones, though, aren't they? That's the problem. Yeah. So have you been taken over by social media and all these texts? No, I mean, I'm, I'm on there, but I don't... Uh, I don't um, I, I'm not religious. I tweet about once a week if something particularly interesting occurs to me. What's happening to you after this tour with the band? Uh, this tour takes me up to just before Christmas. And then I'm doing a couple of gigs with Jethro Tull. All right. <laughs> <laughs> my childhood dream from my early teens. Um... And then, uh, what are we doing after Christmas? I'm trying to make this documentary about beer. Oh. Yeah, yeah. that sounds interesting, doesn't it? It does, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more. <laughs> I'm fascinated by beer. Yeah. Not just in drinking it, but the history of it. We started making beer when we, when we stopped being nomads and started planting crops. So, it actually, beer started being made first in Iraq. Bizarre, isn't it? Yes. But as soon as we kept, became sort of settled, we grew crops with wheat and, and barley and started making bread and beer. Beer, cornerstone of our civilization. Things like that, though, I always think, well, you know, I mean, it's not a simple process making beer, so who thought it up in the first place? Well, some, some people think it happened by accident. But, you know, some bread got left out. People didn't, know, people didn't know that yeast was involved until Louis Pasteur worked it out 200 years ago. Because, I mean, there's yeast all around you, wherever you are, wild yeast in the air, and that's what used to infect the bruise, infecting the right word. Really. It's a two-hour programme. <laughs> right, I'm, I'm going to have to watch it now because you've got me all interested, see? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. They still make some beers like that in Belgium. Yeah. Lambic ales, they make them. So do you look at all the little microbreweries? Oh, it's good. So it's opportunistic. Yeah. Britain is, is, is the only place where, where we still drink a pint of beer in the way that we think of a pint of beer. You know, no one else has it cellar temperature. Everyone else has it freezing cold, so you can't taste it. No one else has it quite as kind of... Well, actually, there's differences within Britain. Further north, you get there like a really tight, creamy head. Down south, it's kind of it's kind of a bit less frothy. No, it's fascinating stuff, beer. You know that? I'll tell you this. In Monastery, because a lot of the records um, for early stuff, especially around the medieval period, it's kept by monasteries. They've worked out from the amount of stuff they were buying in and the amount of monks in the monastery that monks were generally drinking about eight pints a day of 6% proof beer. Whoa. Yeah. Can you imagine? Uh, yeah, no. That's where, the, that's where the idea of the jolly fryer comes from. Right, with the rosy <laughs> cheeks, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Red nose. <And> fat. <laughs> yes. You know. <laughs> beer belly, yeah. Mind you, didn't they used to drink beer instead of water because the water was contaminated? This is true, yeah. Mm. You should drink a thing called small beer. I don't know if you're familiar with how you brew beer, but you, you mash a load of grains and you extract the sugar from them uh, with, by, with liquid. But then they put in, they do it again when, it, when there's less sugar left and you get what's called a small beer. It's less alcoholic, so oh, it's right. 2%. That's what all Dickens' children were drinking. Yes. I mean, everyone thinks the Victorians and that were so prim and popra, but they were all, they mm. were all drunk all the time, weren't they? Yeah. OK, well, we've gone from punk folk to comedy to beer, so... Yeah, medieval monks. <laughs> well, yes, why not? Far-ranging conversation. Absolutely, and I've certainly learnt something today from you. <laughs> Are you going to come and see her then? I am absolutely going to come down and see you, yeah. yes. I yeah. love the Globe. It's one of my favourite gigs. Oh, have you been there before? It's a very then? nice space, isn't it? Yeah, it we've is. played it a couple of times before. It's just a nice size venue, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and you can see the bands. I mean, I've seen bands there as well because I used to follow my daughter around. So, oh, right. And she was supporting people. So, so do you go out to gigs a lot then? Uh, I do like going out to gigs. My favourite thing is to go out in London with my friend and we go to places like the Dublin Castle not knowing what's on, and see, we just see like three or four bands in a row of people we don't know and never will. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's all, well, it's just kind of, you see people expressing themselves, and you haven't, you haven't read any of the PR. It's just people's idea of what music is. It's great. Festivals are good for that as well. Yeah, they are. And the thing about a festival, everyone's there because they want to be and because they just yeah. want to listen to music and have a good time. Yeah, and you just poke your nose in everywhere and have a listen. Yeah. Well, I suppose we better do the plugging of the gig and your album, OK? Yeah.
<laughs> okay. Yeah. So if people want to uh, listen to your album and buy your album, how how do they do that? Uh, oh, the usual thing, you know. Well, everyone buys through Amazon these days, don't they? It's bizarre. <laughs> yes. It's horrible, isn't it, that there's such a kind of grip on it like that? Bring from a company that doesn't pay UK tax. No, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's not the same as hanging out in the HMV on a Saturday morning, is it? It's not, is it? Mm. I, went, I grew up in a small town called Pocklington, and there was only one record shop, and it was upstairs in the haberdashers. Mm -hmm. and, and it had about, you know, 100 albums. <laughs> <laughs> and we just used to look at all the covers. <laughs> well, that's it. It was the place to be, wasn't it? Even yeah. buying music was a social event. It had a booth. <laughs> yeah. It had a booth. Well, like it looked like a sort of... A uh, telephone kiosk that you get in a hotel. You could go in and listen to the album. Yeah. <laughs> see if you wanted to buy it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or just see who was there, basically, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> OK. And you're going to be at the Globe on Wednesday, the 27th of November. That's right. Yep. OK. We shall be there. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, and well, I'm certainly looking forward to it anyway. Thank you, Aid, for talking All to right. us today. It's been a pleasure. Uh, yep. Yeah, nice conversation. Thank you very much. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Radio Cardiff.